So for uh, those of you who don't know me, um, I was uh, lucky enough to spend 17 years at Apple working on some really cool things, followed by some time at Intel working on some really cool things. And uh, while I am the CEO of Silver Spring, I'm still an engineer. I am a technology junkie. And I love seeing new technologies and figuring out the promise of what they can do for the world. And you know, I'm sure you all have seen things like Wi-Fi and things like smartphones where the hype wasn't as big to start with and what they ended up doing was many, many times bigger than what I think anyone imagined. And I'm gonna start by echoing something that Bob said earlier, which is the hype around IoT, I, I, I've never seen anything like it. And in fact, I think part of the reason that adoption of IoT is somewhat slower than people would like is that people are confused. Um, the hype changes, it grows bigger and bigger. You know, every week you read something crazier and crazier. And as, as my job as CEO of Silver Spring, I get to go talk to a lot of city planners and utility managers and IT professionals who know they need to roll out some kind of an IoT network, but they're not really sure what to do because everywhere they read, it's something different and it's confusing. So I spend a lot of my time bringing into sort of, you know, mortal words uh, what people have to consider when they talk, look at rolling out IoT networks. So I'm gonna kinda go through that, I won't say sales pitch, uh, that technology pitch with you today. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, uh, it'll be kind of clear what we, you know, what I and what we think are the important factors you need to think about when you roll out an IoT network. So, there are kind of three right now on the market that are credible. There's a bunch of others, but frankly, when you have a network where you can't upgrade the firmware on the end device if something goes wrong, I can't imagine anybody would actually even consider using that. So that, those to me are kind of dead from the start. Um, the three big ones, and I'll tell you, my company does Ysun, so we're a little biased. You have Ysun, which is a wide area standards-based network. It's based on an IEEE standard. If you leave with nothing else today, the idea, standards good, proprietary bad, is what I want to put in your head. Um, it can be a, a star or a mesh topology, and we're going to talk about this in a little more detail. We have kind of a little cool video in a second. Um, and it's made for wide area, uh, generic Internet of Things, and it's been rolled out in massive scale. Uh, my company alone has 20, over 26 million devices running in the field um, all over the world. Uh, Laura Wands, obviously something getting a lot of press these days. It's uh, proprietary, uh, done by a company from Europe. Um, very similar to uh, Ysun in that it uses uh, sub-gigahertz unlicensed spectrum, but it is a star topology, not a mesh topology, and the jury's still out on whether or not it's going to scale. NB-IoT, uh, I see this a lot. It's sort of the latest darling in the press. Um, certainly has a great pedigree from 3GPP standards. Um, as with a lot of uh, things that come from big standards bodies, you know, there's, you're starting to see fragmentations. There are multiple NB-IoT implementations. Uh, you're starting to see chipsets available. It's a little too early, really, for me to pass judgment on whether or not this is going to be a uh, contender or not, but there you have it. It's one of the latest things to hit the market. Now, I touched a second ago on this concept of star versus mesh, and it's an important consideration when you're building out an IoT network. So we have a little video we put together to kind of explain the differences. So if you could roll the video, please. The Internet of Things holds great promise for helping people live well and organizations thrive. Cities, utilities and businesses worldwide are connecting sensors and devices to ensure that critical services are delivered on time, all the time. Choosing the right communication network is a key first step. Most networks today are star networks like Wi-Fi and cellular. In a star network, every device must be able to speak directly to a base station, and therefore black spots are common. Star networks are inflexible and cannot adapt to local outages or urban development. To get close to full coverage, you would need many more towers. Mesh networks are different. They're designed to be flexible and enable highly reliable connectivity, even in the most challenging environments. In a mesh network, every device connects and collaborates with its neighbors. Unlike star networks, a mesh actually becomes stronger and more resilient as more devices are added. When a new device is added, it automatically checks its neighbors to find multiple reliable connections for redundancy. In the event of an outage, endpoints will automatically find an alternative path. 
or if the landscape changes, the mesh automatically responds. In a mesh network, devices and sensors can speak directly to each other, improving network speed and efficiency, while enabling even greater intelligence. However, not all mesh networks are created equal, and there are a range of other factors to consider. Modern advanced IP meshing verifies communications at every link in milliseconds, providing robust security and authentication to control access. For example, if a rogue device attempts to join the network, it should be identified and blocked. They must also be durable so your assets remain connected for many years to come. They should use open standards to avoid being locked into one vendor. They should offer guaranteed service levels to ensure network uptime. The list goes on. Every IoT application is different. Contact us to explore if standards-based mesh networks are the right choice for you. Thank you, and I'll, I will uh, put in a plug that the Wysun Alliance has a really great white paper on their website that talks a lot ab about this in a lot more detail. So if you're interested, please go download the white paper. So when I go talk to city planners or I go talk to even uh, you know, utility planners who are building out these networks and trying to decide, the message is really, you know, what kind of network do you want to build? And really, it, it's, it's a, you can sort of simplify it into maybe a handful of factors. Um, do you want to build something that's proven that is running at scale, or are you going to take a bet on something that's a bunch of slideware? And there's a lot of slideware these days. As you are building out an IoT network, you don't know how many devices are going to be on that network. You don't know where they're going to be. So picking a network topology, like Mesh, that the more devices that get on the network, the better it works in many cases. The fact that it scales really well is very important. This is something the, the last speaker touched on, and I'm gonna hammer on it again a little bit at the end. Security, I, I am actually, as, as an engineer, I'm horrified at the level of security or the lack thereof of some of the things that are even being rolled out in this day and age. It doesn't matter whether something is critical infrastructure like the electric grid or whether it's something as simple as a thermostat or a video camera. Security has to be uh, you know, priority number one when it comes to building and deploying wide area or, or any kind of IoT network for that matter because enough devices at scale, no matter how unimportant they may be, um, can cause lots of problems and we've seen this happen already at least several times. And worrying about compatibility and, and uh, for uh, future proofing is something else that I really spend a lot of time talking to people about. I mean, you know, today, a, an urban planner or a, a, a networking professional may have a single use case that they have in mind for their wide area IoT network. But you really can't think that way. You have to understand that these networks are a big investment. They're a deployment that's gonna last for 10, 15, 20 years. You wanna make sure you have something that is going to last um, and is going to be future-proofed and is gonna be extensible for use cases you can't even imagine today. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples right now. Um, one I think people in here will find funny. Let's talk about copper-based wiring. Um, I'd say this is a case where people were lucky. You know, so telcos back in the early 1900s deployed copper-based wiring. You know, they, they had a single use case in mind. It turned out, magically, over the years, there was enough capacity in that to bring on the birth of the internet. And even today, you know, I'm, I'm sure the cable companies will argue with me, but in many cases, DSL lines and the technology provided by the telcos is more than enough for internet access for a large number of people. So this is a case where a technology was deployed. I don't think people were thinking ahead for this kind of stuff, but it survived well beyond, I think, what anyone else would have reasonably expected it to do. Now, I wanna talk about something a little closer to home for my business. We have smart metering. Now, the first generation of smart metering, people said, hey, I just want to, I want to eliminate the need for somebody to drive around and read the meter. It's going to save me money. Great. And there were some people that deployed networks that essentially, as you drove a truck down the road, they would be chirping out data and it solved the problem. They got some high percentage of reads. It was cheaper than having people walk around. Then, however, new use cases come up. It turns out that you want near real-time reads. You want to be able to do uh, uh, services for your customers to show what they can do to reduce their bill. Um, this is a much higher level of accuracy that's necessary, a much higher level of utilization. You can't do that with drive-by, so you really have to have a network capable of doing this. 
Now what we're seeing is that the meters on the side of houses are, are being read in some cases every 15 minutes. And the meter doesn't just have your usage data. It has all kinds of crazy information about the line quality and the voltage quality and all kinds of other things about the electric grid. And this is being used in a big data way to provide the utility with a way to optimize and provide better service to their customers. So the, the people who went out and, and deployed these drive-by chirp networks, say 10, 15 years ago, suddenly find that they need to rip and replace everything, which is not a great place to be in because they didn't think about the future. And talk about the future. I mean, certainly as distributed generation and electric vehicle charging becomes more and more a reality, this is, even, this is gonna get even more critical because the demands of the electric grid and the, the ability to control and, and monitor that grid get even more critical over time as these new use cases come on. Let's talk about street lights. Very analogous. Early street light control platforms turn the lights on and off. The second sort of version of that uh, would give you power quality, would let you know how much energy was being used. What we're seeing now, though, is the street light is an integral part of a smart city development where the lights and the cameras and the sensors are used to provide security and other factors for, to improve quality of life of the citizens. And it's not just about knowing if the bulb is burned out. So again, these first generation use cases that where people rolled out really inflexible networks can't provide what's needed to go forward. New applications, these, these are kind of the fun ones. I'm kind of a, a winery, I have a bit of a wine habit. Um, it's easy to have when you live in California. Um, we're seeing use cases for agriculture, which is fantastic, right? So you see today where people are installing probes to monitor moisture. Um, you know, they've gone on to put more advanced probes into the soil to get better chemistry readings on what's going on. But you can actually see, and I've seen demonstrations of this already, where the vineyards and the control systems and the agricultural watering systems and even the control systems inside the winery are all tied together to provide an integrated system. So, so from the time the grapes are growing to the time the wine is bottled, you have a process that can maintain and, and gather data to know what the quality is that you're producing. And it's kind of fascinating to see something as old as winemaking, an industry as old as winemaking, being brought into sort of the technology age. This is one that isn't perhaps as, as glamorous as winemaking, but I think it's even, obviously even more critical. Um, in many cities, there are issues with gas leaks. And you know, it's uh, up until now, people, the utilities have relied upon folks walking around, smelling the gas, calling in, um, and in some cases, you know, not till after something really drastic occurs. So you have these wide area Internet of Things networks. The, the sensor technology has now gotten to the point where you can build battery powered devices using sensors that will provide notification before critical events happen. So before we would have sensors that you had to plug in, they would provide methane levels when you check them. We now have the ability to do real time detection of methane levels and do push notifications if there are issues detected, all connected to the same wide area networks that cities are rolling out for lights or metering or other use cases. And this obviously isn't just a nice to have, it saves lives. And of course, the end state here would be the sensor knows where it is, knows what valves are around when it detects the leak, it actually shuts the valves off before an event can occur. And this isn't just something that's possible to happen, the technology exists today where this can happen uh, in a relatively straightforward fashion. So I'll say the last factors you should consider um, when rolling out a network, and again, I'm a little biased here, when you're future-proofing stuff, you, uh, rolling out a network that doesn't have the performance and the latency already today to service needs that are immediate, um, it would seem silly to me to roll that out. You know, you don't want to roll something out that's state of the art 1997. It's just, it's, it's crazy because the use cases, as we just saw, are only going to increase. It's not like you're going to have this network that's static, that just, that today it, it does what it does and you're never going to want to add things to it. So we think having something that has both low latency and high performance is, is just, critical, along with security. And I, I can't emphasize this one enough. Um, the the Sun standard that we're an advocate of is an IEEE standard. And sitting on top of that are internet standard protocols for, for doing everything from hardware root of trust up to certificate-based authentication for the devices, key exchange and rotation, 
Uh, we have hardware crypto modules on the devices to make sure the keys can't be compromised. You can't leave these as an exercise to the reader when you roll out IoT networks. There, there has to be, I agree, that there should be some sort of minimum level of security that's documented just as a best practice in terms of rolling out these networks. You can't bolt security on after the fact. You either build it in from the ground up or you have a network that's not going to be secure and that's just the way it works. And then scalability, we've touched on this, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but I guarantee you that whatever people wanna to deploy today when it comes to IoT networks, that number is gonna explode once the use cases actually become more real and we start to see more and more devices being developed and deployed. So you need to have a network that's both scalable and reliable. And honestly, today, like, like I think I mentioned at the beginning, I think the best thing to do is to also use a network that's been deployed at scale and it's proven to work. So why Sun? We think the mesh topology and we think the fact that there are millions and millions of devices running already at over 99% uptime is the logical choice. Um, LoRa networks, uh, you know, I, I personally have lots of questions around the ability for them to scale, especially given some of the, the um, packet repeats they do in order, to, in order to maintain reliability, we'll see. And then BIoT, like I just said, I said earlier, it's, it's a little too soon to really know where that stands. But if I were picking one today, I'd pick the one that actually is proven to work. Longevity is something that people don't necessarily think about, and it's equally critical. So we, my company deals a lot with the critical infrastructure world where they wanna roll something out and not touch it for 10 to 15 to 20 years. So when you talk about IoT and IoT devices, um, one of the things I talk to our customers about is you need to get in writing that the devices will be supported and will work for the time frame that we're talking about here. Because in technology, I mean, 10 years is beyond an eternity. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's something it's hard, it's hard for most technology companies to even think about. When it comes to IoT networks though, these networks have to be up and performing, especially utility networks where that critical infrastructure is put in place and then capabilities are wrapped around it that keep people's lights on and keep people's electricity on. And in, in, you know, in many cases, that's a life-saving feature. So, when you talk about device longevity, it's a different kind of time frame when you're looking at networks like this. Um, the LoRa folks say they're gonna have networks that last that long and devices that last that long. I just once again say, okay, let's get it in writing. And then BIoT, um, again, it's a little bit too early to say. With that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much. We have a, a booth next door. We're showing our developer kits and our new uh, technology that we're announcing here at the show. And uh, thank you very much.